Hey guys, so I wanted to talk a bit about what's been going on in the United States recently and I guess just talk a bit about what the heck is going on with our country because I feel, and I'm sure I'm not the only one that feels this way, but I feel like our politics in America is broken now. And you might not feel the same way, but I'm just, I'm just sharing how I feel. But based on the last couple of weeks, I really feel like our politics and our political system is just broken. And there are many reasons for that. For one, um, we had a presidential candidate almost assassinated because of radical, radical thinking, radical speech, and radical just indoctrination by different groups and even just by our by our political reporting these days. I mean, you can't go five minutes without hearing something on some news network about how this political candidate is horrible. And the advertisements are just so inflammatory and, and just so accusatory that it's ridiculous. So it's no wonder that there are people out there that are getting that are that are that are getting indoctrinated into this thinking of, well, the only answer is is that. But not only that, we we had people, okay, this is why I got the whole thinking going with, with this and why I think American politics is dead. That's probably going to be the title of the video. Why American politics is dead. The downfall of the United States. Or something like that, you know. But why, why is it that in our country it is considered okay by certain groups of people to react with disappointment when someone misses fatally injuring someone. Why is it okay in people's pea brains to celebrate that kind of action or to or to I guess glorify that kind of action? Because I saw people on Twitter, I saw hashtags and topics trending on Twitter that I thought I would never see in a million years. Things like, how do you miss? They missed two inches. You know, stuff like that. It's like, why in the heck does anyone think that this is okay? And it's not just the left in that, in that whole, well, the radical left and their whole reaction to that. It's also this reaction from the right side following Joe Biden's announcement yesterday that he's dropping out of the race. And now we have people, you know, we have people saying, well, if he's unfit to run for office, he's unfit to stay in office, blah, 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 blah. Do you really want the, the office of the president to be switched over that badly? Because I know what will happen if they do that. If Joe Biden steps back and and lets Kamala Harris come in and fill in in the interim, he, I know exactly what they're going to say. Oh, this was Kamala's plan from the start. This was Kamala's plan from the start. She's going to take over and she's not going to allow the election to continue, blah, 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 blah. Because you know what? I know the rhetoric of these kind of, the, these kind of radicalized idiots on both the left and the right. It's this idea that if it's not exactly the way I want it, then it's rigged, it's wrong, and it's bad. And then we have people, um, we have this Republican official, a post, a post just posted today, this Republican official introducing J.D. Vance at a Trump rally, saying, if we lose this election, it's going to take a civil war to save the country. This is the kind of radicalized thinking and indoctrination that we're fighting on both the left and the right. And that's why I say that American politics is dead because we celebrate the potential demise of a political opponent. We, 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 we express disappointment when that demise doesn't happen. And then we continue to push and push and push our elected leaders and officials to do things that benefit us rather than just doing their job.
oh, oh, we don't like this guy, so he needs to be taken out of office. Where was that kind of rhetoric? Where was that kind of thinking when the former guy was committing crimes while in office? Oh, and, and, and then there's this double standard on um, cognitive ability, all right? We have this double standard on cognitive ability and cognitive capacity when it comes to people on the right and people on the left. Um, you know, people on the right, they look at Joe Biden and they're like, oh, well, he's unfit for office. He's unfit to even serve, blah, blah, blah. And then they look at their own candidate. <laughs> they look at their own candidate making the same silly mistakes because he's old. That's all it is. They're old. They're geriatric. They're getting up there in age. They're going to have gas. They're going to have mistakes, right? But you have one guy who's getting all the flack and one guy who's their prime candidate and their star candidate. And it's like there, there could not be any more cognitive dissonance between the two groups if you tried. And it's just, it, it, it's just sad. I'm sorry. It's just sad. You've got people on the left and the right who are doing things that make absolutely no sense, that are benefiting no one but their own party, that are they're basically just dividing the country even more. You know, um, a guest pastor that we had at our church last week talked about love and how we need to love our neighbor. And he talked about love is patient, love is kind. Love keeps no records of wrongs. You know, we, we like to say that at a wedding. We don't like to say that when it comes to friends and family. We should. Because love is patient, love is kind, is not strictly re reserved for a married couple. Love is patient, love is kind, love keeps no records of wrongs, love rejoices with the truth, love takes, love does not rejoice in falsehood or in sin but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. Love hopes all things. That is not just for a relationship. That is for a friendship. That is for family. That is for the church as a whole. And if we don't get back to this whole idea of cooling the temperature down, getting back to the bare basics of just serving the people in our offices, we're going to find that many, many, many problems that we have in America just get worse. We're not helping the country by dividing the country. And this rhetoric of, oh, well, if it doesn't go our way, the only way to fix the country is to go to war with ourselves is not helpful language. It's not helpful rhetoric. It's not helpful for your party because you know what it makes your party look like? It makes your party look like a bunch of traitors and dissidents. It makes your party look even more guilty than it already does. It makes your party look like they absolutely planned January 6th instead of just maybe having a snowball out of control because of rhetoric that you should have kept policed. You know? I mean, I'm not saying that January 6th was planned. I'm saying that no one really did a whole lot to stop it from happening. But I'm not saying it was completely planned. But the the onus, the onus rests on you guys to do your best to not exacerbate tensions and, 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 and create wider divides between left and right, between moderate and liberal, between honestly, just between countrymen. Because, because I have neighbors. I have neighbors in my church. I have neighbors in my community that do not see the political spectrum the same way I do, who, if I were to voice these concerns and these opinions out loud in front of them, I would be decried as a Biden-loving, um, gun-confiscating, um, abortion-approving liberal when I'm not. I do not think that abortion is right. I do think that there are times where the, where the line can, can seem gray. 
I do not believe that that all guns should be taken away, but I do believe that we should have reasonable limits on who can and can't have them. I don't believe I don't I don't necessarily agree with every single liberal talking point, but I can see the virtues of both left and right in the way that they speak. When 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 there is good lawmaking and policy making being done, I do not look at party, I look at policy. I do not look at allegiance, I look at intent. I do not look at anything other then is this going to be in the best interest for my nation, for my country? Because honestly, in this day and age, that's what we should focus on. The Bible warns that there will be a division between father and son, mother and daughter, brother and sister, husband and wife, cousins, family, even within the church in the last days. It does not, heat, it does not need helping along. It's going to happen regardless. But by goodness, if we're going to help it along, we need to get back to actually, or if, if we're helping it along, we really need to rethink what we're doing. Because if we're helping this kind of thinking go further than it already has, we're not the answer. We're the problem. We're not the solution. We are the problem. Be the solution. Be the answer. Be the better person. Turn the other cheek. Be. You know, I was watching a show the other day, because it's it's available free through Sling, free stream. It's called The Boondocks. It was on it was on years ago, and a couple of the episodes of the se of the series are free. And I was watching the one where, um, in an alternative timeline, J um. Um. Not JFK, but um, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. doesn't actually die when he gets shot, but he goes into a coma for 30 years. And when he comes out, it's the early 2000s, and it's right after 9-11. And he goes on TV, and they ask him what happens and what they ask him about what he feels and what the, na what the nation should do now. And he talks about turning the other cheek, and everyone turns on him. When just a few decades ago, everyone would have would agree with that kind of rhetoric, with that kind of idea, because we were so spiritually minded at that point that we thought, oh, well, of course, we're going to try and seek peace rather than continuing to turn up the heat. And yet nowadays, we have people that instead of saying, turn the other cheek, they hear that kind of, they can I heard one story about a guy a preacher who preached on love your neighbor, turn the other cheek directly from the Bible. And afterwards, some of his parishioners came up to him and criticized him for preaching liberal talking points. I'm not kidding. Jesus is too liberal for the church now. What? <laughs> Jesus is too liberal for the church. Turn the other cheek. Love thy neighbor. Um, do good to each other. Um, take care of the orphan and the widow. Heal the oppressed. You know, that kind of, free the oppressed, that kind of thing. That's too liberal for you now. What have we come to that this is the, the attitudes that... that supposedly good church-going people are thinking now that that we can justify and and even 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 defend this kind of this kind of backwards thinking that oh well we don't need to take care of our neighbor i'm guilty of it too i am because i will see people on the street hoping to get a couple of dollars for an extra meal or something and I won't have enough beyond my basic needs. And I'm not will, and, and I do not always have the willpower to be able to deny myself and serve my neighbor, to deny myself my creature comforts or my basic needs to help serve someone else's basic needs. I'm guilty of that too. 
But the fact is that we need to be more intentional about being better at that, about being the, the image of Christ in the world, because he knows that we're not doing as well as we could. And he knows that we're desperately in need of people that are willing and able to be that light, be that hope, be that love in the world, because honestly, there's not a lot of love left. There's not a lot of love left anymore. We have left love on the shelf. Oh, that's a pretty that's a that's a pretty trophy. Oh. God is love. Yeah, that's a wonderful thing to have on on a on a wall art, right? Love is patient, love is kind, or or the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Yeah, sure. We can have that as a poster on our wall all day long, but act up, ask us to live that out, and we balk. Ask us to live that out, and we find 50 million different reasons why we don't need to do that today. Why we don't need to do that right now. And so that's why I feel in today's world, we are failing as the church that Jesus Christ intended us to be. But we can be better. But it requires us allowing a form of grace for people on the other side of the aisle. Because while I do not agree with every liberal a, every democratic talking point or every democratic intention. I also do not demonize and vilify them to the point of othering them. I do not take their political identity and line it up with Satan as a precedent, whereas some people have and do. Some people have said, oh, well, if you're a Democrat, you're not a Christian. How dare you? I'm sorry. How dare you take the position that if you are not a gun-toting, you know, if you're not a Republican, how dare you how dare you add a condition onto what it means to be a Christian? The Bible warns us about this. The Bible warns us about self-righteousness and false righteousness. In fact, the Bible says they will have a form of righteousness but deny the power thereof. Deny the power thereof. What does that mean? It means that, oh well, we claim Jesus, but we don't know Jesus and we or even if we do know Jesus, we definitely don't take it. We definitely don't take hold of the gifts he gives and use them to the advantage of others. Not our advantage, not our advantage. We are not self seeking, but rather, if we are the church, we are to seek others' benefit. And if we don't do that, we're about as bad as everyone else in the world. If we don't do that, we're no better than anyone else. And we're not exactly the church. <laughs> Beloved brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ and in the faith, I ask you to do one thing. Consider the way that we treat other people. Consider the way that you treat people who do not agree with you. People who are part of the other party, so to speak, and ask yourself, would Jesus do that? Would Jesus act this way? Because Jesus sat with tax collectors and prostitutes and thieves and murderers. He sat with those that, by our standard today, we would distance ourselves from. But because Jesus was Jesus and is Jesus, he said, no, I am going to do more than just sit and tolerate people 
I am going to sit with them and love them. We can do better. But it takes all of us working as one, as the church, to love the unlovable. In quotes. Thank you, guys. I pray for our nation, and I pray for you, that whatever you do, you would be the best of who God has made you into, who God has remade you into in his image. Thank you for watching, for listening, for sharing, for subscribing. Take care.